my, one of my heroes, Flannery O'Connor, of course, when it was proposed to her, oh, the Eucharist is a lovely symbol. She said, well, if it's only a symbol, I say to hell with it. And that's a very good way to sum up the Catholic attitude toward the Eucharist. If it's only a symbol, why bother? In chapter 3, Bishop Barron talks about the Eucharist and how we say it is real in a completely different way. When we say that he is really, truly, and substantially present, we say it differently than we do the other sacraments. We believe the power of Christ is present in all of the sacraments, but we only say that his real presence is in the Eucharist alone. On page 71 in chapter 3, he begins to lay out an exposition of John chapter 6. In it he says, In many ways, the Catholic doctrine of the real presence flows and continually returns to this conversation. Thus, we must attend to it with a particular care. When they asked Jesus how he had gotten there ahead of them, the Lord chided them, saying, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. One of the things that John chapter 6 illustrates most of all is not something uncommon to what the premise of this book was from the beginning. Namely, that at the beginning, people were attracted to Jesus for all manner of reasons. The novelty of his speech, the power in which he spoke, his charisma, and of course, even his miracles. But as we see in John chapter 6, something happens when people are drawn close to him. He begins to teach them. He begins to challenge them. He begins to give them sayings and words that are more bizarre, surreal, supernatural, however it is that you wish to define or identify the way in which he speaks to other people in these instances. Little by little, people move away from him. As he goes along each step, telling people that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood, those who are there who are followers of him and even disciples become perturbed, disgusted, confused by his words and leave him behind until only a very, very few remain. What an apt analogy then for the real presence of the Eucharist. Many people can agree with the corporal works of mercy in the church, of the service that the church does. That's easy. But once we start talking about morals, how many people move away? Once we start talking about spiritual truths and sacramental truths and things of a supernatural nature, how many more people are turned off from the message of the gospel? It's not enough for us to look at what Scripture says. We can easily be said to be looking for the answers or reading answers into Scripture itself. After all, countless people have read uh, John chapter 6 differently from Catholics. That much is obvious given the number of denominations that do not believe in the real presence and the number of Catholics that don't believe in the real presence. So one other way of approaching that, not only for Bishop Barron, but for the church, is our tradition. You'll know that the Catholic Church does not believe that the Bible alone has all the answers, although it is foundational and principal to the study of our faith. Rather, it is also the case that our tradition, how faith was handed down, how it was interpreted, Tradition in and of itself is not infallible in the sense that every action that has taken place over the course of human history, even within the church, is not infallible in and of itself, but that over the course of time, how things were debated, viewed, argued, prayed about, studied, investigated, all of those things matter to us as Catholics. And the history of it, if you look closely at the history of our faith, that from the very beginning, the earliest communities, the earliest churches, not just from what we hear in the Acts of the Apostles, again, that would be purely an appeal to Scripture, would not be sufficient enough. Rather, we also have the saints. 
the early church fathers, as we call them, bishops, priests, deacons, monks, religious, and indeed extending even until the present day, how is it that we hold on to what the apostles taught? And a way that we know what the apostles taught are how the earliest Christian communities lived their life. We have, as Bishop Barron explains in his book, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Ignatius of Antioch, and one of my personal favorites, Origin of Alexandria. A great saint and a profound scholar, he writes this, Bishop Barron mentions, on page 79 and 80 of This Is My Body. Origen writes, You who are accustomed to take part in the divine mysteries know, when you receive the body of the Lord, how you protect it with all caution and veneration, lest any small part fall from it, lest anything of the consecrated gift be lost. End quote. Bishop Barron continues, In the same way, he urged them, you must strive to conserve and reverence every word of the revealed text. So Origen did not just talk about the bread and the wine, the body and blood, but also of sacred scripture as equally as profound and important. And he continues, Bishop Barron, quote, If Origen and his community held the Eucharistic bread to be nothing but a symbol, why would they even think of treating it with such exaggerated respect? And the very fact that this practice could be employed so blithely as a point of comparison proves that the belief in the real presence was, even at this early period, utterly taken for granted. Symbols are not in and of themselves bad things. There are many things which are symbolic but hold great personal significance. Take for example someone's wedding ring. No one would confuse a piece of metal for the genuine love of a husband and wife, but that piece of metal exists as a reminder, as a keepsake, as a sign of the covenant. We do run the risk then of thinking symbolically. That is to say, we see things that represent something else and we tend to think that things only represent other things via symbol. The difference between symbol and sign is an important distinction in our faith. We lose track that something can actually be something as well, rather than a stand-in for something else. That is what the word signify means, that something actually represents what it is to us and to the world. What follows in the book then, Bishop Barron also acknowledges as this is a part of our tradition. How do developments in our doctrine come about? How does our understanding of revelation unfold over the course of time? Well, the truth of the matter is, is it's, it's not just a straight line of insight, of truths upon truths, that, as I mentioned before, the argumentation that with truth, there is also falsehood. With being correct, there is also being incorrect. And with one way of going about it, there are others. And in the book, he talks about this path. One of the things that is interesting about the early church fathers, that despite all the concurrent with them in the world at large of the philosophical development, theological development, even from within the church, uh, great strides at expanding language and insight into scripture and God alike, among many other things, that the notion of the Eucharist was very guarded, very reserved, very conservative, if you will, in this sense that from Ignatius to Origen to Chrysostom to Ambrose, so on and so forth, they would not stray far from the language of John chapter 6 and of St. Paul and of Scripture. And I suppose you could say with good reason. But as it stood, as time moved on, Bishop Barron writes about the medieval period, the early medieval period and the heart of the medieval period. And one of those figures who comes up is Berengarius of Tours. I won't go into excessive detail uh, into this notion, but 
um, or of Berengarius himself. In the book, uh, Bishop Barron does well enough job, and for those of you who are more casual uh, readers and learners of theology, uh, it's merely a point to allow you to understand where these derivations began, uh, this understanding of the Eucharist. It didn't begin with Berengarius, even going back a long way, there were arguments about what the Eucharist meant and how it was. The same was true of who Jesus was. So if there were questions about the person of Jesus himself, surely there would be questions about Jesus in the Eucharist. But with Berengarius of Tours, he talks about this. Berengarius struggled with the notion that Jesus was present in the Eucharist and that that Jesus in the Eucharist could be the same Jesus born of Mary. It didn't seem right to him. That the Jesus in the Eucharist could be the same as the Jesus who is present and incorrupt in heaven just seemed absurd. And if bread and wine could degrade and be destroyed, how could that be the same Christ? You could see the simple logical proposition that he makes, or rather the hypothetical syllogism, if you will, that if Jesus is incorruptible and perfect, then he cannot be bread and wine. For if he were bread and wine, he would be corruptible and imperfect, because bread and wine can be drunk and eaten and broken down and fall apart and degrade and be destroyed. And Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord of all, certainly, certainly could not succumb to the same reality. For him, because bread and wine continue, for he said that the bread of the Eucharist tastes like bread and the wine of the Eucharist still tastes like wine, so it's not that they are changed, but that there is a spiritual power alongside the bread, alongside the wine. This notion of being alongside, side by side that is, of what something is and a power beside it, that sort of notion then you would see later on in the Protestant Reformation, especially with Martin Luther. Very early on after Berengarius came with his ideas and his notions, the church was quick to respond and to reject what he said. But it couldn't just leave it. In the course of time and of history, people, especially at the higher levels of education and society, were no longer satisfied with the simplistic answers which came before. I suppose you could say this is more my interpretation than Bishop Barron's, but I think in essence he would agree. What happened then is the adoption of language in order to capture what it is. In fact, this is how we came up with the theology of the word person, which did not come to mean an individual until it was used rigorously in the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries AD to describe who Christ was. Once Christ was described as a person, soon all people came to be known as persons rather than things or instances, just as an example. And so Pope Innocent III wrote at the time that there is a substantial change that takes place in the Eucharist. That use of the word substance, the use of a philosophical language finding its roots in ancient Greece and Plato and Aristotle, soon became the normative word that we still use to this day, that there is a substantive change taking place in the Eucharist. Rather than recreate for you all of the answers that Bishop Barron gives about Thomas Aquinas, I want to go over a few key points. Thomas Aquinas is probably Bishop Barron's go-to theologian, individual, and saint, and indeed with good cause. Thomas Aquinas, not only his extensive writings, but in my view as a scholar, if you will, Thomas Aquinas is remarkable in his ability to synthesize information. True, he innovated certain things over the course of his time, but his primary aim, not only as a professor of theology um, and as a priest, as a religious, 
was to innovate and create, but rather to synthesize, to put together. And adapting to the new language and the academic innovations of his own time, likewise to work towards something in that way of making it approachable and understandable. Thus, even to this day, Thomas Aquinas is very widely studied indeed. Thomas Aquinas stresses that our faith is in the authority of Jesus. Indeed, all the many points that Bishop Barron writes about through Thomas Aquinas are worth listening to and reading. Again, I recommend you look at that section of the book once more to really take it in because it is quite dense. But one of the sections of the book that begins on page 93 is of great importance when he talks about the third objection to the real presence of the Eucharist. I do not think that the other points are unimportant, but this point here seems to be, according to Bishop Barron, a direct conversation intellectually over the course of time, that is, with Berengarius of Tours and those who held his position. Thomas Aquinas talks about the proper species of a thing and the sacramental species of a thing, in this case, the Eucharist. The proper species of something is how it appears, how it exists, how it presents itself to us. Whereas the sacramental species is unique to Christ, that Christ is not limited by time or other constrictions, especially the resurrected and ascended Christ, the Son of God and the Word of God. And so in the bread and wine, its proper species, he says, is the appearance, the taste, the width, the breath of bread and wine, but that the sacramental species really is Christ, that Christ is present, not that he's split up into a hundred or a million or a thousand different little pieces in the bread and wine, but that he is truly present in the bread and wine in a sacramental way. Again, going back to page 92 in his book, he talks about how we place our trust, our faith, in the authority of Christ's words. Bishop Barron concludes the sort of historical survey by talking about sort of a modern innovation. It's not a modern innovation in the sense that it's entirely new or out there in the sense that the ancients wouldn't have understood, but it's a way in which we've progressed in talking about language and how language functions to reflect reality. Bishop Barron closes chapter 3, essentially, by talking about the difference between declarative language and performative language. Declarative and performative. I'll give you an example. When I hold up this book by Bishop Barron, I say that this is Bishop Barron's book. I'm declaring something. I'm pointing to a thing and identifying what it is. I declare with my language what it is. Pretty obvious, right? I don't think anyone from 4,000 years ago would disagree. However, take for example this little charging dock, I guess you call it. I would call it, see I just declared what it is right there, but if I said this is Bishop Barron's book, I'm making a declarative statement, but it is clearly false. Now, if I were also to say this is Bishop Barron's book and that I changed it, Whoa, how did that happen? If it were to change like that, it would be performative. Performative in the sense that my words effected a change, had power. So the difference between declaring that this is a book and conjuring this book, for lack of a better word, is the difference between declarative and performative. So you see that with declarative and performative with us as human beings, there is something to it. Most of what we do, most of what we say, is in fact declarative. However, we sometimes have authority vested in us. Bishop Barron likes to talk about baseball, not just in his book, but in many of his videos, that an umpire saying that a batter is out or safe 
is not just declarative but performative. His words affect the rules of the game. Bishop Barron gets at the point that when it comes to God, his words in some sense are always declarative, but that his words are also always performative. That the word of God, Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Spirit, when they speak, they act. This is expressed once again at the beginning of the book of Genesis all the way throughout of scripture and Jesus mirrors and mimics this scriptural basis that what he says truly means something. That when he says something in a different way as we talked about in John chapter 6 and in all these other things, it really truly means something. I could go into greater detail about the content of Bishop Barron's book, but I think that point alone is a through line and a thread carried throughout all these different chapters in meal and in sacrifice and in this chapter about reality. That at the end of the day, we're basing it on the authority of Christ. We're basing it on the words that Jesus gives to us, the words that our ancestors in faith were serious about and wanted to hand down under any circumstances and even died for that that same faith that those words this is my body and this is my blood are not just something that declares a reality but it performs a reality hence my role as priest in ritual that my hands here were ordained for this very purpose that I was blessed by the line of bishops that came before the bishop who ordained me all the way back to the apostles, ordained me to perform these most important words. This is my body, this is my blood.